Welcome, welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you are calling in from. Glad you guys could all make it to a, uh, another CP Solvers uh, VMR for non-English uh, speaking um, students, residents, interns, attendings. Uh, happy to join you. Um, my name is Travis Smith. I'm a CP Solvers team member. I uh, work in the emergency department and I'm also a dean at LECOM and uh, help teaching students and involved in clinical education. Uh, this is one of the, my favorite times of the day. And um, hopefully today we have a case presenter uh, for us and I'll introduce the rest of the team. First, Gabriella, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi everyone, thank you for being here with us in this Saturday morning. Um, I'm Gabriela, I'm from Brazil and I'm a neurologist here. Just finished my residency three months ago. Uh, very excited to be here. So uh, Hafa, do you wanna go? Sure, uh, hi everyone. My name is Rafael and uh, I'm also from Brazil. I'm a last year medical student. And uh, I was just talking with everyone that I was actually on shift. <laughs> I couldn't sleep <laughs> the last 12 hours. So I'm sorry in advance if I say something <laughs> not ordinary. And uh, Sukriti, can you introduce yourself, please? Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Sukriti. I'm from India. And I hope that you all are good. Sorry about my broken Hindi and uh, taking a cue from Rafa, everyone who's from India today. Um, we're all under lockdown um, in different states and uh, uh, just I've been having so many erratic sleep patterns because of the lockdown. So Rafa, I, I haven't been in the hospital, but totally understand. Um, I think uh, uh, um, Ravi or Anne-Marie, would you like to introduce yourself? Hey, MK, say hi. Hey. Hi. I hope everyone's having a great day. Sorry, that's my dog in the background. I'm just uh, here to observe uh, you all being awesome. Are you are you camping? No, no, I'm just in my backyard. Looks like a very nice backyard. And really does. Avery, I, I, I couldn't sleep last night. I woke up at four o'clock in the morning and I couldn't go back to sleep. And I said, what am I going to do um, until my kids wake up? And so I listened to your episode, the case that you presented on Thursday. And wow, was that fascinating. So if you guys haven't checked out the Thursday's case, it was a doozy. It really, really was a very special doozy. Hello, everybody. My name is Robbie. I am I'm originally from Lebanon and I grew up in Pakistan and now I'm sitting in sunny San Francisco at a dog park where my uh, puppy is running around somewhere. Who knows? Hopefully he'll survive the next 52 minutes. I'm kidding. I see him. Relax. Rafa gave me the, Rafa gave me the eyes, the roll eyes. Oh, bad doggy daddy. <laughs> it's true. I'm a little bit more lenient than most, but whatever. You only have one life to live, human or dog. Might as well live it to the fullest extent. Um, it's so great to see everybody today. Um, what we use, don't lose your dog. <laughs> okay. You know what, y'all? I'm leaving. And what we, before, um, before we jump in, I, uh, I really wanted to highlight Anne-Marie's incredible case. And it really was a case centered around diarrhea. And I really, really encourage you to check that out, um, to check out the whole hour if you have uh, time for that to check out the teaching points um, or to check out Travis's tutorial on a on a specific dimension of the case itself, which is a, a specific blood test that he tweeted about today. So um, who has a case for us today? Cue the awkward in quotes silence. I'm gonna do a countdown in my head for a case. What number are we at now? Oh, wait. Why are we do? Oh my God. <laughs> Gabby, that's so funny. <laughs> yes. The case of the lost dog. Oh, he's right there. See, he's being really good.
I think we lost her. Oh no. Did you lose me, folks? I'm sorry. I can't tell you, if my internet's cutting. It was a little bit delayed, but I think you're back. Oh, okay. Maria, did you say hi? Hi, Rami. Please don't lose your puppy. Oh no. I have a 360 view on my puppy. And he's very clingy. He's not going nowhere. Alrighty, who has a case for us today? Anybody? Nada? Zero? Oh. Uh-oh. Oh. Sans case? Okay, I'm going to give it a minute. Up. Up. Ooh, Drew, Drew's feeling like, forget the medicine, talk about life. You know, um, Drew, I had an existential crisis yesterday, so I'm putting my life to the side and put it on a pause, not in a dramatic way. <gasps> Ooh, Anne-Marie has a case to present. Rafa has a case? No. Can we? Are we really going to make Rafa present after 12 hours of being on call? Maybe. Nobody has a case? Nobody else? Nada? Oh, I see. Ooh. Come on, y'all. Show up. You know, it's like it's, we're, we're, the moment that we're waiting for is like the surprise, like somebody just like emerges on stage from like thin air, you know, like or somebody's elevated onto the stage as a surprise guest or somebody's like just dropped on there. Come on, y'all. Who is it going to be? I knew it. Oh, my dear friend. You know, I got to meet VJ one-on-one -on -one last time because I forgot to close my Zoom meeting um, on Wednesday's case. And there he was, his kind soul right there. And we got to hang out for a second. But now I'm excited to hang out with him for a whole hour. VJ, please unmute yourself. Um, tell, Introduce yourself to the VMR crew. And um, after that, we'll get going. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Vijay. I'm currently a first year medicine resident from Bangalore. Uh, very happy to be here. Vijay, this it's a delight been... to see you. It's truly a delight to see you. Can you tell us a little bit more about your life outside medicine? Uh, currently, we are in a national lockdown at present. But otherwise, I love playing basketball and uh, table tennis. Nice. Basketball. You know, I grew up in in the uh, in South Asia, and I tell you, not many people play basketball. How did that come about? Uh, this probably due to the height and uh, in school, it just started off as a hobby in school and yeah? just carried on. Amazing. Wait, how tall are you? Uh, six one. Six one. All right. You know, by the way, I just realized in the middle of asking that question that for some reason that's probably on the borderline of appropriate to ask somebody how tall they are. I don't know if it's technically inappropriate, who knows? Um, so my apologies if that's now public information and you didn't wish to say that you are now a six foot one VJ. So this VMR episode, Gabby, please title it, Man Loses His Dog and Calls Out Human for Height. <laughs> all right. Well, VJ, please, please, please um, take it away. We'll, have, we'll take over the screen. And I encourage all of you to participate in the chat. We wanna make this everyone uh, we want to have as many voices heard as possible in addition to all the dog um, barking and screaming that will happen in the background so please please jump on in the chat and we'll all uh, think about vj's case together all right vj ready to hear it it's my first time presenting the case uh, i'll i'll try to do it uh, as efficient i can so i'd start with the chief complaints of uh, of fevers in seven days Right-sided headache and facial pain since four days. And double vision since three days. Uh, uh, should I stop here or I think, uh, should I give a little bit of the HP? Oh, it's so juicy. It's very rare that there's a lot to work with here, but I think we should practice this alone. So, um, Travis, tell us where you went.
first thing I thought of was um, fever, you know, something localized, um, you know, around the brain, specifically cavernous sinus thrombosis just came to my mind. I know DVTs can cause fevers, but, you know, the, the tempo, I think, of the, uh, the symptoms is kind of what I'm going to be focusing on, um, you know, when we get more information. You know, given this foreground, taking a look at the background, risk factors for the uh, for the person, how old they are, um, what medications they might be taking, uh, risk factors that they might have in their life, and kind of center it around there. I think if you look at you know base rate for uh, fever and facial pain in the ER for me, I'm going to be thinking dental abscess because those are the patients that you, a lot of times come into the ER. So. Once I couple that with double vision, you know, my radar is going off. I'm getting a little bit nervous and worried about, uh, you know, this person, they could have some uh, intracranial extension of an abscess or something like that. So I definitely am gonna be focusing on their background um, and then maybe some other modifiers in their history that might kind of direct me on the best imaging to get and uh, labs and, and, you know, I'm already starting to think about, you know, antibiotics and stuff like that. So that's kind of where I'm going right now. Awesomeness. I love it. Raquel, can you tell us how you say uh, headache in, uh, in Spanish? If you're able to unmute yourself, I know you weren't last time. Yes. Um, oh. dolor de cabeza. Say that again. Dolor de cabeza. Oh, se, the, term, the medical terminology is uh, cephalea. Cephalea. Wonderful. Can you, I, I, I know that you've probably spoken up in VMR, but can you just reintroduce yourself to the crew before you, before we uh, reflect on other stuff? Uh, okay, well, well, um, I'm Raquel Horowitz. I'm from Venezuela, but I'm living here in the U.S. I'm working in a, a urgent care in the Bronx. And well, I, you know, I, I love medicine. <laughs> Amazing, amazing. Thank you for being part of the VMR community and for um, sharing your thinking. Um, Gurbani, tell us more how you're thinking about this. Um, yeah, uh, so I think um, with like fever, I think about inflammation, malignancy, autoimmune, autoimmune drugs, and, and um, endocrinopathies. But then like mapping that on to the brain, I kind of think in general categories of like, is this like a meningitis picture? So I think like a the physical exam can be pretty helpful um, in terms of like a kerning or Brzezinski sign. Then I think about um, abscesses and some of them that that's already been mentioned. Like you can have like also in like the cavernous sinus um, or like spinal cord. So if you get um, other signs of like, I don't know, like uh, incontinence um, and like lower extremity weakness, um, difficulty walking, et cetera. Um, then I think about like, there could be other types of infections. So like um, encephalitis, um, so like HSV is one, um, other viral infections. And then I also think about um, malignancies, but since it's only been seven days, I think um, that's like lower on my differential. Beautiful, absolutely super, but I have nothing to add to that. I'm curious, Kushal, do you wanna tell us how you say headache in Gujarati? I've never heard it before. Yeah, it's it's called mata no dukao. It's literally basically mata pain no in the head. Oh, oh, you said say it again. Mata no dukao. Mata no dukao is mata head. Is that what? Yeah, mata is head. Dukao oh, is pain. Is oh, it's, it's very literal. Yeah. yeah, it's so cool. I absolutely love it. Thank you. Can you tell us what uh, esoteric infections came to your mind? Take us to the deep depths of ID, please. Yeah, about the esoteric infections, first of all, I would like to get the HIV test uh, to at establish the immune status. Uh, with HIV and brain, you can always think about possibility of crypto, toxoplasmosis, uh, uh, CNS lymphoma, uh, uh, CMV infection as well, herpes, uh, all of them can get disseminated as well. Uh, Jesse virus can cause PML with reactivation if the uh, CD4 is too low. And uh, I would also keep in mind about uh, vasculitis. I'm not sure what's the patient's age uh, because that would GCA would also can present like this. But yeah, if HIV is positive, uh, 
our options are limitless. So that would be, <laughs> and also TB, considering India is endemic for TB. I was like, is he really going to go the whole uh, time reflecting without saying TB? So I'm glad you snuck it in. Before. Also, histoplasmosis, right? Yeah, there we go. <laughs> HIV, TB, histoplasmosis. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much, my friend. It's so nice to see you here. Um, so what I would say, um, actually, you know what? Before I, before I do that, I would love Gabby, our neurologist extraordinaire. Um, maybe you and Maria, I'll have you divided however you like, can just teach us how you approach diplopia. Um, yeah, so I think I was going the same path as Travis because uh, this person has a fever and a headache. So it, and it, she, she, she or he probably has um, diplopia due, so, due to something uh, that we have to check because this, these are all red flags for the headache. Uh, and I think about double vision, we have to assess if it's vertical or horizontal horizontal and first of all we have to check if it's monocular or binocular because if it's binocular it's probably something um, from uh, uh, not from the from the eyes uh, properly speaking so if it's monocular prob probably it's something from, from the eyes and if, if it's binocular it's something behind the eyes uh, for example the cranial nerves or uh, um, uh, the third fourth or sixth cranial nerve and so this these are some things that i think about diplopia first localization and and then um if it's monocular or binocular Beautiful. absolutely superb thank you maria what anything to add to that it's going to be hard yeah i should have gone first <laughs> But I agree with Gabby. I think like first you have to see if it's binocular or monocular, you know, like everybody can have like double vision. They just go like, like if you try to, if you try to see double, like if you, I don't know how, how to explain it, but I think everybody has experienced that and that can be normal. So uh, we have to make sure, um, as Gabby said, like if it's monocular, you know, if you cover one eye and you continue to see double, then it's monocular, but if you cover one eye and you still see double, it's binocular. And then uh, localizing features, you know, we have three cranial nerves who, uh, you know, do all of our eye movement. So you have to like localize which one if you have problems with like abduction, adduction, or no, no, no problems at all. And then always check for like cranial nerve three has a lot of cool stuff they do. So uh, you also have to check, you know, like, if it's just, you know, like um, extraocular movements or if it's, you know, like the eyelid is involved or the pupillary is involved. So then like you can localize it even further in the cranial nerve three. And I, I think one of the most interesting things we've been discussing uh, recently in VMRs is um, myasthenia gravis syndrome. So always check for like fatigability. Uh, and so like is the person having uh, double vision all the time or is or is it just like at the end of the day or you know associating um, the double vision with something else and then yeah fatigability I think is one of my favorite questions to ask with double vision incredible um, I will um, I will tell you that you have to be very very careful with diplopia and um, let me just take you down that that um, road that Maria and Gabby walked you through and tell you why it's tricky. Um, when we say monocular and binocular, it can be confusing, especially if um, you're learning English, especially medical English. And what, what really you have to do is you walk in and you ask the patient to isolate one eye and see if the diplopia persists or not. And if the diplopia vanished, you have not established a neurological cause. What you have established is ocular misalignment. So if you cover one eye and the diplopia goes away, the definitive scientific conclusion is ocular misalignment. If the double vision persists, you've now established that there are two images landing on the retina in somebody. And the reason two images land on the retina is a problem in the eye in most instances. Okay? What if you cover one eye, the diplopia persists, and you come to the conclusion that the eyes are aligned well, it's a problem in that eye alone. But then you switch to the other eye and you get the same thing. 
you can actually also get a cortical monocular diplopia. The cortex can fool you into thinking that there are two eyes in the retina. So even monocular diplopia can actually localize to the brain. But more importantly, when you get binocular diplopia and you have somebody cover their eye and the diplopia vanishes and you conclude that there's ocular misalignment, the reasons the eyes might be misaligned is there is a neurological issue or there's a space occupying lesion in the orbit itself that results in ocular misalignment. So the key question here is there is a diplopia, is it binocular or monocular? And it likely in most patients is binocular. And then the question is, is a problem in the orbit or is it a problem in the neuraxis? It's no different than when somebody says, hey doctor, I am weak. Your job is to say, is it in the knee joint or is it in the muscles moving the knee? And here, that's the tension. Are we going to go into the eye itself or are we going to go in the cranial nerves? Why is the cavernous sinus the trickiest place? Because cavernous sinus causes neurological compromise and also causes orbital signs by putting pressure on the orbit. And so the cavernous sinus is a place that has both features to it. How do you localize to the orbit? You localize by finding orbital signs. And orbital signs are pain with eye movement, proptosis, and involvement of cranial nerve two is another supportive feature of an orbital process as something in the orbit compresses the optic nerve. So now when you're looking at this patient, is this silent binocular diplopia, meaning there's no proptosis, no injection of the eye, no chemosis, and no pain with movement and normal vision, you're probably in the neuraxis. But if you walk in, you see binocular diplopia, the eye's massive, red, popping out of the skull, you're probably gonna look for an orbital lesion. So here we're thinking about many things. We're thinking about basilar meningitis, which would cause a cranial nerve problem, but we're also thinking about mucor, which would cause an orbital problem. So the key question now is forget the history. Do a quick exam and try to localize, is it orbit or not? And then try to make progress based on localization. So if I were seeing this patient in real life, I would be looking for pupillary issues, chemosis, injection, pain with eye movement, and localizing, and then getting more history. So I'm curious, Vijay, if you can give us that initial triage exam of of the, uh, the initial questions about uh, diplopia and then maybe give us more history after that. Then discussions, uh, I'll just add, uh, I didn't give the age. So the patient was a 70 year old male. Uh, coming to the other symptoms, uh, uh, coming to the headache, uh, uh, he had this dull diffuse headache only on the right side, which uh, did not uh, affect his uh, sleep. There is no any photo or phonophobia or associated loss of smell or taste. Uh, coming to the next symptom of the diplopia. So the patient was not very clear of uh, what kind of diplopia he had, but predominantly he said it was horizontal and there was no associated head tilt or posturing and it was non-fatigable. Uh, also there was, uh, then the patient also said there was reduced sensation over the right side of the face as well. And there was increased redness and pain during movements of the eye of the right side. So uh, these were related to the uh, diplopia. Uh, coming to the other uh, uh, significant histories, uh, past medical history significant for uh, type 2 diabetes mellitus since the past uh, 15 years, uh, not well controlled. Uh, also on uh, conservative management for chronic kidney disease. Um, and uh, uh, one, uh, one hospitalization for uh, diabetic ketoacidosis one month ago uh, was admitted for about three days and then discharged. Uh, coming to the medications he's on, um, he's not regularly on insulin. So he was advised insulin, uh, but has been irregular with uh, the medications. Uh, family history is uh, not significant at uh, this point. Uh, uh, social history, he's, uh, he works, he's a retired teacher. Uh, no significant occupational uh, history or exposures to uh, or any travel. Uh, there are no known allergies or any high risk behavior that the patient has. Um, 
I think I'll give a part of examination. I think uh, that uh, goes into much more details. So, um, okay. Uh, so he he came with the BP was uh, 140 by 70. Uh, pulse was 96 regular. Temperature was afebrile. Respiratory rate of 22. Uh, so they were fairly normal. So. Uh, coming to the general examination, there was, uh, especially in the ocular examination, we noted uh, a chemosis with a diffuse redness of the eye. And uh, there was complete ophthalmoplegia of the right eye. Pupils were, pupillary reactions were spared. Uh, there was some crust that was noted in the nasal cavity as well. Um, cardiovascular, pulmonary, and abdominal were normal. Uh, so neurologically, I think uh, they go hand in hand. I think the ocular and the neuro examination can be clubbed together at that. Um, the left eye was normal. There was no uh, feature suggestive of an INO there. Uh, complete ophthalmoplegia on the right eye. Uh, there's tenderness over the maxillary and the ethmoidal sinuses. On, uh, on the right side. Uh, I think I'll stop at this. Folks, now you know two things. One, whenever we sit and wait and wait and wait for a case, it almost always is absolutely mind-blowing. I've never had that awkward silence not be followed by an absolutely extraordinary case. And th to me, this is like Vijay just popping out of nowhere with just a mind-blowing clinical reasoning exercise. Thank you, Vijay. And you're presenting it just so expertly. It really, really is um, one for ripe for discussion. I also wanted to um, I also wanted to tell you something that I think is happening to all of us. Right now, we are all at high risk of forming a cognitive error. Very high risk. Because what has happened is we are now building a classic illness script for a certain disease. And the probability of said disease may be very high, but these are the circumstances where this, it's a very rare diagnosis that we're all invoking, but it seems so appropriate to invoke it now that I encourage you all, this is the situation in which we make mistakes a lot of the time. Because if you take 100 patients like this who have this exact same syndrome, most of them will not have the diagnosis we're wearing. Most of them will have an atypical presentation of something more common. But the problem is that the diagnosis that we're all biased towards is so lethal that we have to think about it no matter what. But I encourage you to now practice not mentioning the diagnosis that's on everybody's mind and being systematic about it, okay? So let's be systematic. And maybe I'll ask anyone in the chat to ask yourself, we have a patient with diabetes, what infections in general um, are patients with diabetes at higher risk for? So anyone know that? Gurbani's are offering some thoughts. So Gurbani, do you want to start us off? Like when you think diabetes, what kinds of infections are generally higher risk? Um, well, I think about like fungal infections um, being at higher risk. Obviously, mucor, one that people keep mentioning in the chat is one of those. Um, so hard not to mention it, isn't it? <laughs> I know. Um, and then I'm blanking on the one that's like in that's the okay. feet, but there's another uh, one. I think Vale has is going to add to that. I think she just she just uh, mentioned that in the chat. Do you want to unmute yourself and tell us more? Yes. Hello, everyone. I mean, oh. I'm just remembering um, from Sketchy. Um, I believe pseudomonas and mucor are the two infections that I always associate with people with diabetes. Also, I think I also remember sometimes they cannot present with the stimulitis. Yes. More commonly yeah. than Absolutely. the general population. Absolutely spot on, my friend. Ashwarya is thinking about uh, telling us about UTIs. Can you tell us more? Uh, diabetic individuals are more susceptible to the UTI uh, 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 because of that uh, more sugar content. Yes. Uh, uh, Bacteria will be more in that site. So I thought of UTI. Absolutely. Can you tell us a little bit more about yourself, Ashwarya? I don't think we've heard you on VMR before. At least I haven't. Yeah. Uh, hello, I'm Aishwarya, final year medicine, I'm an MBBS student from uh, India. Yeah, really? that's all. 
welcome, welcome. It also looks like a puppy really likes your voice here. Came right up to the computer. <laughs> welcome, it's a delight to have you here. And I think that's a great thought, a really, really good thought. I'll add to it in a moment. Surya is adding more, uh, more about um, a couple of possibilities, candidiasis and others. Do you want to tell us more, Surya? Oh my God. So hi. Uh, so um, um, I'm Surya, and uh, so I was talking about uh, skin infections uh, uh, taking place more in a diabetics. Uh, from the point of view of a candidiasis, it can be. Uh, a dermatologic or esophageal acanidiasis, or, and, uh, or they have more risk of having a carbuncles and which are developed into furuncles. Uh, again, uh, adding to the point which uh, Eshwarya said that uh, they have more a glycemic a content. So uh, it is a good a culture for all the bacteria that's, uh, that could be a commensal in, an, um, in a normal setting, but in a diabetics are considering the immunocompromised. So yes they become a pathogenic. Absolutely. Very, very well said. Can you tell us more about yourself and where you're calling from? Yes. Uh, hi, I'm from India. I just uh, graduated from my MBBS program from Amora Nazar Medical College in Delhi. And uh, I recently found out about this uh, from my friend Anilayan, who has been a regular here. Yeah. So, yes. Well, and I'm really happy to be here and, and be learning every day. Wonderful. Every it's night for me. Yeah. <laughs> it's a delight to have you here. Thank you for sharing yeah. your thinking and hope to hear more and more from you. Thank um, you. So, you know, the, the spectrum of increased infections in patients with diabetes is extensive from routine bacterial infections to fungal infections. So, and, and many organisms have higher risk, but the organisms that go from here to here in terms of skyrocketing of risk, the one gram positive organism is group B strep. So group B strep has a much higher rate of invasive disease in uh, patients with diabetes. There's a whole list of gram-negative organisms of which meliodosis and pseudomonas are much, much higher risk in patients with diabetes. Um, as you were mentioning, Ashwarya, UTIs in general are more common, but also emphysematous urinary tract infections, which are gas producing, are much, much higher higher and almost exclusively occur in patients with diabetes. Uh, the range of fungal infections is also extensive and includes a high rate of mucocutaneous candidiasis, endemic disseminated endemic mycoses, and the feared organism mucormycosis, for sure. And I tell you, it's hard not to, um, not to worry extensively about mucormycosis. And I know we have an ID guru in the, in the chat in the form of Kushal. So Kushal, can you teach us what you know about mucor? Hi, <laughs> I'm no ID guru, but I know a few things about mucor. The only thing I would I, <laughs> The only things I know is I think what I picked up from Arabi and uh, Rafa. So uh, with mucor, uh, you get uh, you are more commonly at high risk to get it uh, in patients with uh, hematologic malignancies, uh, uncontrolled diabetes. Uh, and most common uh, findings we see with mucor, uh, you can it can present in uh, rhinoorbital mucormycosis. You can also get pulmonary manifestations from that too, where you can get reverse halo sign, which is uh, opposite of halo sign. A halo sign is aspergillosis, where you get consolidation surrounded by ground glass infiltrates, and mucormycosis is ground glass infiltrate infiltrate surrounded by consolidation. Uh, I think uh, recently they had an NEGM case on that as well. Uh, with mucormycosis, it's, uh, as uh, we all discussed, it's really important that uh, we diagnose it urgently because if you miss it and uh, it gets undiagnosed, the mortality is really high. And you usually start the treatment with uh, amphotericin uh, and uh, you need surgical debridement as well. Uh, the other thing with mucor is uh, if patient is on ion chelating agents, the risk is really high because mucor feeds on that iron from the ion chelating agent. So that's something to be mindful of. Please, superb, my friend. You told us that mucor can begin in the upper airway, lower airway, um, and disseminate everywhere. It can also begin in the GI tract and is one of the very few infections that can actually infect the stomach. 
which is crazy. He told us that um, the risk factors are hematologic in nature in the majority of patients, but we have to keep out, keep an eye out to um, subtle and unexpected mucor in patients with iron with iron excess. Um, also, you have to be careful of patients with chronic acidosis. So renal tubular acidosis is a subtle but important risk factor for mucormycosis um, as well. And uh, Bharat is teaching us about muliodosis. Bharat, do you want to unmute yourself and tell us more? Oh, I think um, I think we lost Bharat. I think um, they're no longer um, here on on VMR. I'm not sure what happened. Okay. Um, Brilliant stuff, folks. Um, Bharat, if you're if you're back uh, and I'm missing you, please, please forgive me. Just jump on and interrupt anytime. Um, I think the progress that we've made now is we've localized this to an orbital problem. And we went from diplopia to is it eye positive or eye silent? And the eye is very positive. And the orbital, the orbital diseases here in a patient, oh, Bharat, it just came back. I'm going to ask him to reflect in a moment. Um, but I think now this is a very, very concerning situation um, for the possibility of mucor. So, um, Bharat, oh, I don't think he has a mic. Okay, it's okay. Um, Bharat, if you're here, we just saw your um, your comment on uh, miliodosis. Do you want to unmute yourself and tell us more about um, what you know about miliodosis, Bharat? Um, hello. Yes, I'm Bharat. This is my first time here on Virtual Morning Report. Thank you for having me. Yes, this was something I also got to know about very recently, um, miliodosis, which is um, another infectious disease, which is more common in diabetics. It can affect a wide range of organ systems, ranging from the skin to the lungs, and it may even cause sepsis. This is what I know of, probably even I will have to read more about this because it's something very new to me as well. Thank you. Incredible, Bharat. Do you want to just tell us, since this is the first time you're calling, where you're calling from and tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi, um, I'm Bharat. So I have also recently finished medical school from India. I'm from University College of Medical Sciences in Delhi. Right now, I'm in Florida. I'm here doing an observership in the Department of Internal Medicine at, at Orlando Health. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us. It's so nice to meet you. Um, I have a teaser for the crowd before we pass on um, the mic to uh, BJ to take us um, as far as he can before the answer is revealed. Most infections come from the lung and disseminate elsewhere. TB, histo, the list of metastatic lung infections is very long. But I will challenge you all for fun and for practice to think of what infections have a propensity to metastasize to the lungs from somewhere else. Okay, so play that game in your mind. Metastatic infection from lung, very common. Oof, the list is so, so, so long. TB, Brucella, TB, not Brucella, that's cheating. Um, TB, histoplasmosis, all the endemic mycoses, all the fungi. But what infections start places and go to the lung. That's a fun one to reflect on. But I will um, give the mic to Vijay to um, take us as far as he can before the uh, data is revealed. That was a brilliant discussion out there. Uh, I think I missed one point uh, because here we are looking for a local cause. So the oral cavity, the oral hygiene was good. Uh, there are some few uh, probably necrotic spots in the palate as well, which I missed. That would be a very uh, important point clue here. Um, so I think that is, I would like to add that to the examination. So coming to the labs, uh, so the hemoglobin was 12.1 uh, with the peripheral smear showing a nomocytic nomochromic anemia. Uh, the, total, the total counts was 18,400, uh, neutrophil 91 and the lymphocyte of eight. Uh, platelets were 1.5, 1.4 lakhs. Coming to the renal parameters, we have a creatinine of 2.56, a bun of 64, sodium of 131, potassium of 4.0, and chloride 112. Uh, urine uh, analysis, uh, it shows uh, 2 plus proteinuria, uh, normal, no RBCs or WBCs, microscopy normal, no cast or sediments. Uh, HbA1c is 11.5. Um, yeah, uh, LFT is normal. So I think this is, I think uh, this will give us uh, almost the diagnosis. Uh, a swab was taken from the nasal crust. Uh, it showed a broad-based aseptate branching hyphae, hyphae and fungal filaments 
that was seen. Uh, I think uh, that was there. Oh, oh amazing. That gives us the diagnosis. All right, wonderful. Okay, I'm going to ask somebody from the chat to tell us what they think the answer is. Who wants to? Anyone can unmute themselves and say it. Who wants to do it, brave soldier? By the way, I'm doing this. I'm hoping to meet somebody I haven't met before. We'll see. Who's doing it? Who's doing it? It's Mucor. Oh, Drew. Boom. Hello, Drew. Hello, hello, hello. Um, yeah. Uh, also, sorry for the cell phone cam. Uh, as I had mentioned yesterday, my computer decided to die. So, um, uh -oh. yeah. Uh, coming to you live from cell phone cam world. <laughs> That's so great to see you here, Drew. Yes, yeah. Mucor it is. Vijay, can you teach mm -hmm. us about how you came to this conclusion and what you learned from this case? Yeah, uh, so I think uh, the huge teaching point here was uh, uh, making the diagnosis early, I think, was crucial. But uh, sadly, this patient had a stomach course. So uh, within about uh, three days after admission, the patient had the disease became bilateral. He underwent a debridement and we started him on liposomal amphotericin. So it was somewhere at 3 to 5 mg per kg body weight. Uh, we started him at that. The issue was he also also had a chronic kidney disease, so that was also another uh, issue with that. Uh, but sadly, we lost the patient uh, uh, four days, uh, two days after the surgery. Uh, he developed a temporoparietal uh, CVA, uh, and uh, and he had a diffuse septicemia and septic shock, and we lost the patient. So uh, reflections for from this was. Uh, I think any uncontrolled diabetic, it needs a very high degree of suspicion uh, to pick these things up. Uh, probably if we would have got it a little more earlier, patient presented earlier, uh, we might have been able to do something. Um, so those are the things uh, that uh, that was a huge take home for me and uh, advising the patients to uh, uh, stressing the importance of adequate uh, diet and treatment adherence, I think that goes a long, long way in treating uh, these patients. And also uh, lately because of the COVID pandemic and uh, there is irrational use of steroids that are uh, very common here. Uh, so that also I think uh, uh, is a very sad thing. They're seeing a lot of mucor cases of late shooting up due, due to COVID. It is really sad. More than the COVID illness, it's like we give a disease and uh, he worsens. Mijay, I think, you know, I, I'm lucky to have known you for a few weeks now, and I think that um, just the way you carry yourself is something I deeply admire. And, I, and I, what's striking me now is, isn't just the words that you're saying, but also just how impacted you seem to be from the loss of this patient and just the, um, the pain of the death and dying around you. And I think, um, you know, just to be, to be transparent, I think you're the kind of... Um, physician and human being we all strive to be to be so compassionate and thoughtful and to feel that pain a little bit you know you don't want to, to I don't want anybody to suffer but I think it's people like you who are touched so deeply by this these tragedies that turn around and make an impact and here you are educating us again and in our minds we are ready to jump on you course sooner all of us because of this specific case and for all the other things that we learned um, so thank you so much truly for um, being a key member of this community and thank you to everyone who's been participating to Gabby, Maria, Bharat, or I mean Ashwarya, I'm just going through the list, like all the people, Dhruv, Gurbani, Hans, everyone who spoke up today, Kushal, I'm just going down and down and down. And I really encourage you all to have your voices heard. Every time that somebody says I mean every time that somebody new or somebody contributes is a new neuron that fires a new lesson that learns. The, the deeper we get to know each other and the more we participate, the better we all are. So thank you to everyone, truly. And thank you to a special thanks to Vijay for uh, for bringing this case to us. Um, hope to see you um, next week, of course. But of co but before we bounce and say goodbye, we'll go through the journey again of this case and the learning from it from none other than the one and only Maria. So take us home, Maria, please. 
Hi, thank you everybody for being here. Um, and thank you, VJ, for giving me a new case on a Saturday morning. It doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> um, so we started off with a couple of uh, complaints uh, or concerns from the patient um, with headache, fever, double vision. And, you know, with headache, with um, I really like it because it can it can be really straightforward and not say anything, or it can be a defining feature of the case, and it all comes down to red flags, and basically anything that makes you think this is not a migraine or a tension headache is a red flag. So anything at all, um, I really. I, I like to think about red flags as like as if I'm like the youngest student possible ever. So I've like my first day in medical school and I would worry about anything. So that's like a red flag for headaches for me. So if the patient has fever, if the patient has any other complaint or older age, we um, we saw in the chat like GCA going on and it's definitely a diagnosis you don't want to miss. Any type of immunosuppression um, because it predisposes you not to like CNS lymphoma or a lot of other infections like HIV, JC virus, reactivation, CMV, herpes, TB, fungi, toxoplasmosis, like there's tons and tons um, of infections um, causing headache in immunosuppressed patients. With double vision, um, you know, it, it can be a little bit intimidating uh, for uh, some to approach double vision but don't worry because there's always like a wonderful schema that's going to help you so start with very simple like as Robbie said physical exam um check if it's monocular if it if you cover one eye and it resolve and it doesn't resolve or binocular if you cover one eye and it resolves and so with monocular um we might make a mistake but it usually uh localizes to um the eye and if it's binocular it's ocular misalignment which involves you know the muscles and the nerves um, like um, the nerves responsible for the muscles um, and then if it's binocular always think if it's in the orbit like a mass uh, a space occupying lesion or if it's like a neuro more about cranial nerves and you know um, you can localize it with orbital signs you know if it has pain with movement proptosis or if it involves cranial nerve two um, then it's probably in the orbit with neural localization you know always think about your cranial nerves and, and responsible for your um, extraocular muscles so cranial nerve three four and six and then um, there's a lot of places where these intersect or, you know, they interact with each other, but a very uh, interesting one is the cavernous sinus, which involves the cranial nerves three, four, six, V1, and V2, responsible for like the sensation of the face, you know, in like top half of your face. Uh, and then, you know, with double vision, you know, always ask about fatigability and if it's like more, um, you know, more at the end of the day because it, it can make you think about MGS. And, you know, we were really quick to make a cognitive error when we saw like uh, everything from the history and then we heard diabetes. Uh, so don't make cognitive errors jumping to the diagnosis. You know, uh, it's always best to start at the beginning. So we did this amazing diabetes and infection Venn diagram and basically everything under the sun can affect a diabetic patient, but they're at a higher risk for other very funky infections, so fungal, um, pseudomonas, uh, MRSA, um, UTI, and, and especially emphysematous UTI, inv invasive GBS, a new disease I've never heard of, meliodosis, <laughs> I'm pretty sure, like a lot more. And then, you know, you, you want to start at the beginning, but definitely there are things that concern us more than others, so always think about the most worrisome, most morbid, most mortal diagnosis first. In this case, it was mucormycosis. Um, and you know, it presents at a higher risk in patients with diabetes, hematologic malignancies, uh, patients who have an iron, iron, iron overload. And then, you know, the illness script of it is, you know, this patient with this underlying risk factor for mucor which who presents with renal orbital manifestations and pulmonary manifestations uh so um what it was the 
final diagnosis, but you know, it's all about the journey. So, you know, we could have just like read a couple of sentences and said, it's mycosis, but then doing the whole analysis of the case and the journey with all of you, you know, it made our hour much more productive and we learned so much more and we were sure to not miss anything. So always try to go step by step and you won't miss anything. And puzzle of the day to like take, take home is, you know, think about and metastatic infections to the lung. I couldn't think of any, but I'm pretty sure the chat had some amazing ones. <laughs> uh, but thank you, everybody. This was amazing. And it's always great to see all of you.